Hey everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Redis Beard Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Martin. I'm going to be continuing with a little mini-series inside of this season that we started with the last episode, where I read out some of my written work. These are real things that happened to me, real stories that I've chosen to write down. But I know that not everybody loves to read long posts on web pages, so I'm giving your eyes a break and just letting you listen to them as I narrate them. Let me know if you like it, leave me a comment, subscribe, like, share with everybody you know. This week's story is about when I used to work in downtown Detroit as a security guard. You would not believe some of the things that I ran into there, but all stories are true, so check this one out. First, a word from my sponsor. Remember, I get paid per play. So, like this, share it around, play it on any platform that you can. I'll be right back with a story about a guy named Rudy. All right, so the moment you've been waiting for, who's Rudy and why did he make the cut? So, Rudy was a guy that I knew that accidentally burned down his house. You know, like you do sometimes. So the setting for this is back in 2008 on the east side of Detroit. I was working as a security guard for a company that was watching construction sites of Section 8 housing. And this is 2008. It's the end of the housing bubble and everything begins going to hell. If you weren't alive back then, what are you doing listening to my podcast go to bed? If you were alive back then, you know that things got really funky really quickly for millions of Americans and people around the world. So Section 8 housing, if you're not aware, is the government subsidized housing where the landlord collects the rents and the tenants have to pay a portion of it and the government pays the rest. So for instance, if your rent is 1000 a month, Section 8 housing participants would pay maybe 300 a month and the government picks up the bill for the other 700 It's very socialized kind of housing projects that would go up all over the city of Detroit and many major American cities. Now, the thing about the east side of Detroit is that it's got the reputation of being exactly the kind of place that it is. Now, nowadays, 2020, right? I can drive down down Detroit and there's a Starbucks where I once watched a guy get mugged in broad daylight. So the map of the city has changed a little bit, but this was during the worst of it in one of the worst neighborhoods off of French Road. So over in that neighborhood, things kind of disappeared at night if they were left out. And these houses that were being built were kind of like erector set houses where they would drop off a load of lumber and they were kind of like build it yourself. Like the construction crews would just show up and start raising frames that were already kind of prefabbed and preassembled. So from the day that excavators would appear to begin to dig the foundations in the basements, we'd have to have security guards on the site. This was because even the batteries on these giant excavators were worth a few hundred dollars if they had been ripped off and returned to uh, any kind of like large equipment store. And most places in the city at that time, especially, were involved in some kind of side hustle. As a side note, there had been instances of manhole covers being removed from the streets of the city of Detroit because people were taking them back to scrap metal parts and getting the cash for the manhole cover as scrap metal. So they would get like $50 a manhole cover because they could just melt it down and turn it into something else. So the scrap yards were loving this. Uh, but imagine, if you will, just a city street that was full of these giant potholes that just went down into the sewers, all because people were picking up manhole covers. Now, who might do this? The answer is drug addicts, people that are fiending for their next fix. Or people that are just broke and destitute because that's how their lives are in the city, which again, 2008 financial crisis was an increasing number of people. So that's the setting of this story. Rudy was one of the guys who lived in the local neighborhood. He was friendly with our security company and the guards, but we couldn't necessarily always trust him. Sometimes he would do work for us in terms of going around the housing sites and picking up scrap metal that he would then return to get the money for after the construction crews were done. He would also do stuff like run and get 
something from a hardware store for some of the construction crews. They'd pay him 20 bucks and he'd go pick up a couple packs of nails or whatever. And they'd give him the change of a dollar or two just to keep for himself. He was pretty much harmless, though he was almost always inebriated. That's the setting. Now here's the story. He stepped into the park, confused, scared, and a little bit high. He felt the gentle autumn breeze blowing past his body, taking what little warmth he had left off of his skin as fast as it rose from inside of him. He shivered involuntarily, but it wasn't a source of discomfort. If he had to guess, he was in shock. Hey, uh, Rudy, buddy, can you hear me? The guard standing in front of him was asking him, a look of worry apparent on his face. He guessed that he was Rudy, the man the security guard was addressing. He looked around and made sure no one else was there. That's when he realized that it was nighttime, and the more he looked around, the more the fog seemed to lift. There was something wrong about tonight. He couldn't quite remember what it was, but he knew that it was big. Rudy, I'm sorry, man. I'm just a little out of it. I think I hit my head. And now I can't hear so well. There's this ringing. Rudy, where the fuck are your pants? This is when he looked down at himself for the first time. Yes, he was definitely in shock. Because until right now, he hadn't realized that he was completely naked. Well, this explained the shivering and the gentle breeze on his balls. At least that question was now finally answered. Rudy, I'm calling the cops. Stay there. It's going to be okay, buddy. Oh man, don't do that. No cops. My fuckers never did a damn thing good in this world for me yet, he heard himself say. That much seemed a reflex, and somehow he knew it must be true. Also, he couldn't shake this feeling that there was something terrible happening right this moment, and the last thing he wanted was to introduce the police into an already bad situation. He hadn't met a black man yet in the city of Detroit that would opt to bring the DPD into a bad situation if they could help it. Rudy, buddy, I've got to call them if you don't tell me what the fuck is going on. Hold on now a minute. Just give me a minute. I'm trying to think. He lifted his hands to his face and felt something wet. He rubbed at his eyes, trying to force the fog to keep lifting and remember what the hell was happening. As he moved his hands away, he looked down at them and in the dark saw something even darker on them. The wetness smelt metallic, not salty like sweat. The security guard's flashlight went to his face, and at the same time, both of them exclaimed, Fuck, that's blood. Rudy looked closer at the dark spots on his hand, and he thought he smelt burnt wood. That was the trigger he needed, apparently. Yes, he was definitely in shock, and if he had to guess why, he would say it was probably because of the wood floor in his house he had fallen through trying to get out of it as it burned. LT, what the fuck is going on here? Rudy saw another guy walking up to the first one, coming from behind a wall of white and orange lights. Jackson, get in your car and head over to 28th. Swing by Rudy's place. See if there's anything weird going on over there. And check back about our properties next door. If you hear or see anything weird at all, radio back ASAP. Um, LT, where the fuck are his clothes? That's a brilliant fucking question, Jackson. Now let me see if we can get some answers out of him. Hmm? Move. One of the cars backed away and the patch of ground in the park got just a little bit darker. The first guard, the lieutenant that Rudy had called Big Man, he still stood there looking worried and asking questions. Rudy's head was spinning. It was all coming back to him now. The heroin needle, the candles, the curtains, and the empty boxes on the floor. He came out of the daze he was in when he felt the heat from the fires that spread over the curtains to the boxes. The flames were jumping across the room like they were alive, but Rudy was so out of it he could barely move. Tully, do you have an extra jacket in your car? Gym clothes, shorts, anything? This motherfucker's going to freeze to death if we don't get something on him, he heard Big Man say to the other guard. Tully, smaller than Big Man, was a veteran of the Iraq War, always a little too jumpy. Rudy knew when Tully was driving patrols around the neighborhood because he drove like a man convinced that every trash can was actually an IED. That boy simply never came back. Rudy realized he had always thought Tully was a prick, just another white asshole lording power over any black man that he could. 
Tully pulled out a pair of basketball shorts and a t-shirt from his bag and put Rudy's hand on his shoulder while he stepped into them. Now he began to wonder if he wasn't at least a little wrong about the ex-soldier. It seemed that an apparent crisis actually brought out the best of him. Uh, boss, I think I found the problem, the radio crackled from Big Man's belt. What the fuck is it, Jackson? Um, Rudy's house is on fire, but like really, really on fire, came a nervous reply. Fuck, Rudy, what the actual fuck? Uh, Big Man, I think I hit my fucking head. Well, that explains the whole naked wandering in the park with a head wound thing you've got going on here, at least. Tully chuckled. I just called it in, boss. DFD should be on the way now, came Jackson's voice over the radio again. Tully came back into the circle of headlights again, this time carrying a blanket. The warmth of the clothes was welcome now, since the late October evening was really taking a toll on the half-naked man. Apparently, the shock was wearing off. Tully wrapped the blanket around Rudy's shoulders while Big Man spoke into his cell phone. Yeah, that's right. I was just driving past and saw him. Yes, completely naked. Nah, he seems okay, just disoriented. I can't say I wouldn't be either if I had just escaped my own burning house. Yeah, yeah, no, he's definitely high. Um, Because I've seen him both high and sober a dozen times, sir? Okay, yeah, okay. That was all that Rudy could hear. Big man's boss had apparently been alerted to all the excitement. Rudy sat down and started replaying what he could remember again. It was all fragmented and distorted. It was like he was trying to put a puzzle together after being hit in the head and almost set on fire. Rudy, talk me through it. What happened? DFD's on scene. The police are going to be right behind. They're going to want to know what happened. Try to think through it and get it out now. It'll go easier when they talk to you. Big man was right, and Rudy knew it. He started talking things out, explaining to Tully and Big Man what he knew to be true, hoping that as he spoke it would make more sense. I must have picked up a couple of packs, you know. I just woke up and the gear was there next to the candle, but it was hard to see, hard to breathe. I just couldn't fucking breathe. The flames was just jumping around everywhere. I couldn't get to the door. That's when I felt the floor go out. Oh, damn it. That's my mama's house, Big Man. I burnt down the only thing I have left from her. He was rambling and he knew it but it was like a dam and his head was broken and all the secrets behind it had just come pouring out. And that's when it happened. You remember the face staring back at his as he fell through the floor. Oh, shit. No, 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 big man, big man. We have to help. We got to go back. He was crying now and stumbled forward into the big yard. Rudy, it's okay. We can take you over there. Jackson just radioed that the police are there. We can give you a ride over right now. Shit. No, big man. We got to go now. She's still in there. She's still in there. Big Man and Tully both froze in place. They stared at him momentarily, faces blank, and then drained of color. Rudy, what are you saying? Was someone else in there? Big Man, we gotta go. I don't know if she got out. Who, Rudy? Who was in there with you? Did you see anybody else when you left? Tully was speaking into his radio now, asking Jackson if he had seen anybody else walking around near the house. He began clawing at the uniform jacket of the larger man. Please, big man, please, please, please. Rudy, who was in there with you? Was it a friend? Another dope fiend? Who? The face stared back at him through his thoughts. His mind had been chaotic now since he'd realized he was standing naked in the field, but this was worse than the past 20 minutes. He saw her eyes peering back at him, black and lifeless. It felt like she was slowly creeping out of the shadows of his memories, parting the fog, coming for him. Big man, she's going to get me. I just can't leave her if, if she's going to come back and get me. Who, Rudy? Who? Tell me who it is. It's my dog, big man. My dog, Buttercup. Big man's expression turned from worry and hopelessness to relief, and finally to frustration. <sighs> Rudy, you fucking dope fiend. That dog's been dead for five months. I hope you fucking bury her in May. He shrugged off from the now homeless man who collapsed to his knees. He grabbed the radio and called to Jackson, who in turn explained to the police and firefighters that they weren't actually looking for another person. Big man sat on the hood of his car and lit a cigarette, watching the now homeless man sob and rock back and forth the ground. Tully took a cigarette of his own and offered one to the despondent, homeless, Rudy. Rudy, man, you gotta get your shit together. You almost had the LT send people into your burning house to rescue a dog you buried half a year ago from a fire you started because you got high. You need help.
So I guess if I had to say that there's a moral to this specific story, it would be don't do heroin. But in reality, that was just the nature of that neighborhood back at that time. People were really suffering. Drugs were a great escape for a lot of people from the pain of everyday life. That happens in inner cities all over the US. There's an opioid epidemic that we still have yet to get handled. It's been going on for decades. This is a very real consequence, a very real and true story of what happens in the inner city when people are despondent and don't have any hope. Something for you to think about the next time maybe you see somebody that's homeless, or you see somebody hustling on the street. Keep in mind, they have very real problems just like you and I do. They might be different, but they're very real. But again, moral of the story, don't do heroin, especially if you're going to wind up burning down your own house. Please like, subscribe, follow. Go to the redestbeard.com, get on the email list. Go to Facebook, the Instagram, like photos, share it around. If you can, you can subscribe to Anchor's feed of my podcast for as little as a dollar a month. I've got dollar, $5 and $10 monthly subscribers. Every bit helps. And now that I'm paid to play, the more you play, the more I get paid. I appreciate it. I love all of you and thank you all for your support. I'll catch you next week.